120 days, the construction of the Integral is coming to an end. The great historic hour, when the first Integral will soar off into space, is nigh. A thousand years ago, your heroic ancestors subjected the entire globe to the power of one state. A feat still more glorious falls to you, to integrate by means of the glass, electric, fire-breathing Integral. It falls to you, to subordinate the beneficent yoke of reason to the unknown beings living on other planets possibly still living in that savage state of freedom. If they do not understand that we are bringing them a mathematically infallible happiness, it is our duty to force them to be happy. But before arms, we will try the word. In the name of the benefactor, anyone who feels he has the power is duty-bound to compose treatises, epic poems, manifestos, odes, and other works on the beauty and greatness of one state. This will be the first cargo the Integral will carry. Long live one state. Long live the numbers. Long live the benefactor. In the 1920s, Yevgeny Zamaitin penned a novel that portrays a dystopian future. Prior to Orwell's renowned 1984, Wee was the unsung pioneer of the dystopian genre. Zamyatin envisioned a post-apocalyptic society stripped of individuality and humanity. The story is essentially a biography from a mathematician named D-503, the builder of the Integral, who writes to us about one state for alien readers. I'll simply try to document what I see, what I think, he says. More precisely, what we think. Exactly that, we, and let that we be the title of my records. His records would soon be challenged by a woman named I-330. She is seductive, rebellious, and not aligned with one state. She plays a key role in guiding the story of D-503 by questioning his loyalty. Regrettably, We hasn't gained as much popularity or recognition as 1984. That's why I'm here. To give We the credit it deserves. To analyze the setting, and how one state, and the author, depict a dystopia. Let's begin. In a distant future, humanity lives in a self-contained metropolis called One State. It's a megacity of unyielding uniformity and absolute clarity. Their architecture is strictly utilitarian, comprised of simple geometric high-rise buildings made entirely of glass, with no social comforts or privacy. Each citizen is referred to as a number, rather than a person, and must wear sky blue jackets called unis to identify their number. Operating like a well-oiled machine, the numbers function as a cohesive unit that follows a strict routine of waking up, working, eating, and sleeping in perfect unison, with little to no deviation. Obsessed with achieving a state of perfection, one state's policies rigidly adhere to reason and seek to eliminate anything that cannot be controlled through rationality, like individuality and subjectivity. On the periphery is the Green Wall, encircling one state against wild plants and creatures that exist beyond its borders. Now, to understand how this all came to pass, we must delve into its history. A thousand years ago, the world underwent a conflict called the Two Hundred Years' War. This was a war between the city and the countryside, supposedly fueled by religious prejudice. However, the formation of one state was not achieved with guns and bombs, but by conquering two motivating factors of human life, hunger and love. The former was conquered in the 35th year before the formation of one state, when they invented an endless supply of food made from oil, which sustained humanity better than any other food product. By then, only 0.2% of the human population survived the war. This percent became one state, leaving the rest of the world to be reclaimed by the wilderness. 
having conquered hunger, one state led an offensive against that other rule of the world, love, that source of envy and delirium. 300 years ago, this was also conquered with the historic Lex Sexualis, the sexual laws, which regulated sexual activity based on science without any emotional attachment. Each number is analyzed by their hormones and blood, and then prescribed the number of days when they can engage in sexual activity. That's all there was to it. Through scientific advancement without regard for humanity, one state survived the apocalypse to create a society where only it can thrive. Consequently, what exists is a totalitarian technocracy. However, the citizens, which I'll refer to as numbers, enjoy their subjugation. It's not that they are stupid, but because they, along with all other numbers, know that happiness and freedom are incompatible, and happiness is when everything is systematized along a logical, scientific basis. This is the most prominent attribute of one state. By controlling society through purely rational decisions, like machines or domesticated animals, the overall betterment of human life will increase. According to its philosophy, since time immemorial, humans have striven to improve their livelihood by domesticating the wilderness through production, technology, science, and reason. They too subjected and systematized themselves just like what they did with the wilderness to improve their lots in life. According to this assertion, the aim of human nature and its history is to attain a state of complete non-freedom. This goal is considered to be the ultimate phase of human progress, or simply put, one state is the conclusion of history. One state culture is based on hyper-rationality, each number capable of reasoning through every course of action what is beneficial to one state. Numbers also rarely act on emotions, easily discarding them as a form of illness. Standardization is heavily emphasized as well. It is an essential component of what is called state science, resulting in a highly efficient but cold and unfeeling society. The pursuit of knowledge is limited to what is already known, which creates a highly ordered and controlled society without individuality or creativity. The government of one state is not only a totalitarian technocracy, but is also a theocracy, as it's ruled by a mechanical god known as the Benefactor. The Benefactor was created to bring humanity to that total state of non-freedom, happiness, and rationality. But not just that. D-503 finds it absurd how the ancients worshipped unknown gods who gave them nothing but ambiguous reasons to sacrifice. In contrast, they now worship a precisely known deity who orders human sacrifices through calm, considered, and rational decisions. All numbers attend a public sacrifice to the benefactor as a celebration to remember the 200 years war and subsequent victory of one state. A second liturgy is a yearly election called the Day of Immunity. It is less of an election and more symbolic of the time when humanity entrusted their lives to the benefactor. Below the benefactor is the Bureau of Guardians, who monitor all activity, including the collecting and public reading of information. They do so through street membranes, posted on every street to record the conversations between numbers. Below the Guardians are the various agencies that serve as organs within the larger body of one state. Let me read down a few. The Bureau of Operations consists of doctors who work under the direct guidance of the benefactor. Their job is to remove any illnesses that could infect the numbers, such as irrationality, subjectivity, individuality, dreams, inspirations, and the formation of souls. Five centuries ago, the agency was attacked for acting like an inquisition. D-503 debunks this, stating that the Bureau operates according to reason, 
while the criminal acts out of a freedom to kill. The Sexual Bureau regulates all sexual activity of the numbers through the Lex Sexualis. Their motto is, every number has the right to any other number as a sexual product. Every number is analyzed by the Bureau to determine the sex hormone content of their blood and draw up a corresponding table of sex days for that number. The number then makes a statement about whom they want to engage in sexual activity with and they receive a booklet of pink tickets. These tickets are used to roll down the blinds of their glass apartments when they can engage in the act, the only privacy they have. The child education factory is where children are educated, supposedly by roboticized numbers. D-503 reminisces about his teacher, Pliapa, who had to be plugged in and had glass legs. All children are under the custody of the benefactor, and, like livestock, the children are taken to be refined into becoming numbers of one state. The Institute of State Poets and Writers controls all expressions in art. Literature is strictly utilitarian, possessing no instance of fictionalized subjects or opinion pieces. Allow me to read off some titles. Mathematical Knights a popular book on the teachings of arithmetic. Flowers of Judicial Sentences are publications about the people who are sacrificed before the benefactor. Daily Odes to the Benefactor are documents that engrandize the keen rational wisdom of their god. The Man Late for Work is a tragedy that allegedly happened when someone didn't attend the work hours. Stances on Sexual Hygiene is a book about how numbers are to engage in intercourse. And lastly, The Three Freedmen is a story about an experiment where three numbers were freed from work for a month. Soon, they felt a deep longing to be assimilated back into one state, that after ten days... A hard lesson about how free will does not equal happiness, and how human nature craves conformity. Moving forward, we have the Musical Factory, which uses hymns to signal the numbers to move from task to task. They call this Mathematical Composition. The composing of its music is through what are called music nometers, which allows the user to create sonatas within an hour without needing inspiration, which they regard as a form of epilepsy. We lastly have the Accumulator Tower, which absorbs clouds, leaving the sky completely clear. Allegedly, a similar process was done to the oceans, removing the waves from the shores. The tower's purpose, like the music nometers, was to eliminate unpredictability and prevent moments of dreaming and inspiration. How savage were the tastes of the ancients if their poets could be inspired by those absurd, floppy, and stupidly jostling heaps of vapor, asked D-503. I, like, I'm sure I wouldn't be mistaken to say, we, like only such a sterile, irreproachable sky as this. Let's now turn our attention to the numbers and how they live. Each number is regulated according to what's called the Table of Hours. This table regulates each second, minute, hour, and day of their lives. Each morning, Millions of numbers rise in unison and march in column to their work. All as one, they lift the food to their lips, the oil substance that has replaced all food products. The table also sets compulsory hours for working, going on walks, visiting auditoriums, and doing what is called tailored exercises. Within these 24 hours set by the table, the time between 4 and 5 p.m., are personal hours, when numbers can freely engage in whatever activity that's available before the table orders everyone to retire to bed. This lifestyle is an analogy to scientific management, which in real life was an applied science developed by Frederick Taylor to enhance economic efficiency, particularly the productivity of labor. This was to be done by simplifying the task of workers and organizing them effectively. In we, 
Taylor's ideas had been taken to their utmost limits. Yes, Taylor was undoubtedly the greatest genius of the ancients, proclaims D-503. True, he didn't think of extending his method to the whole of life, to every step, to the entire day. He didn't manage to integrate his system from 1 to 24, but all the same. How could they write whole libraries about some cons or other, and scarcely notice Taylor, that prophet who succeeded in looking ten centuries ahead? When it comes to learning about their history, facts are not altered like in 1984, but discriminated against. The main character makes frequent comments on the absurdity of the world before the rise of one state. Here are just two. How the state authority back then, if embryonic, could allow people to live without anything like a table of hours, without compulsory walks, without precise regulation of the times of food, that got up and went to bed whenever it entered their heads. Some historians say that in those days, apparently, lights would burn in the streets all night, and all night, people would walk and ride through the streets. Isn't it ridiculous? to know plant breeding, poultry breeding, and fish breeding. We have precise data that they knew all this, and not be able to reach that final rung of that logical ladder, child breeding. Unlike 1984, we does not utilize Newspeak to dumb down the language to prevent critical thinking. Instead, they remove abstract concepts from their vocabulary. Abstract concepts are ideas that have no physical or spatial limitations, such as emotions, metaphors, and abstract actions. This eliminates any subjective notions and the concept of pleasantry, thus consolidating one state's power as everything becomes predictable and not subject to interpretation or chance. Even irrational numbers have been removed, because they give credence to an infinite number of answers. This is also why the Green Wall exists. For what can be a greater threat to one state than the unknown? Besides we being a science fiction novel, it is also a commentary on free will in relation to God in the Book of Genesis. One state is an analogy to Eden. The benefactor is God. The guardians are angels. D-503 is Adam. I-330 is Eve. And another number, S-4711, is the devil. A double agent working to bring down one state with the help of I-330. S-4711 belongs to an underground resistance called the Menfi. It's a play on of the word Mephistopheles, who was a demon in the book of Dr. Faustus, who reveals to the doctor secret knowledge. Their mission is to destroy one state by opening it to the outside world. An analogy of eating the forbidden fruit, which opens the eyes of the consumer to the knowledge of good and evil. A number, R13, makes a reference to this. You see, the ancient legend about paradise, I mean, it's about us, about now. Those two in paradise were presented with a choice, either happiness without freedom, or freedom without happiness. They, the blockheads, chose freedom, and only we have realized once again how to return to happiness. We have helped God finally overcome the devil. It was him, wasn't it? that incited men to violate the interact and to savor pernicious freedom. He was a malicious serpent. But we plant a great boot to his head and crack. And that's that. Paradise. And once more, we are simple-hearted, innocent, like Adam and Eve. None of that muddle about good and evil. Everything's very simple, childishly simple. All that's good, all that's majestic. Splendid, noble, exalted, crystal clear, because it protects our unfreedom, that is, our happiness. 
Later on, D-503 references Christianity as an imperfect precursor, as both believe that we comes from God and I from the devil. It could be argued that one state aims to create the heaven on earth that was prophesied in the book of Revelation, the 200 years war being the apocalypse, and one state being the New Jerusalem. To quote D-503 once more, Our gods are here below us. In the bureau, in the kitchen, in the workshops, in the lavatory. The gods have become like us, ergo. We have become like the gods. And to you, my unknown planetary readers, to you we shall come to make your life divinely rational. Like ours. To conclude, We is a fascinating and thought-provoking novel. Whether it's realistic or not, it doesn't really matter. Its consistent themes are as numerous as they are captivating. How physical comfort and material prosperity are not a fair exchange for free will. How there is no final stage in human history, and is instead a continual cycle of change, as I-330 puts it. And whatever is this final revolution you're wanting, there is no final one. Revolutions are infinite. It could be read as a critique of organized religion, or perhaps militant atheism. To modern readers, it can also be read as a warning of trusting AI over human instinct. Most of all, it's a rapturous love story on the dynamics of the human spirit. Everything one state does to solidify its totalitarian system is by making everything so logical and mechanical to the point where citizens are unable to conceive of feelings that cannot be controlled, such as love, dreams, beauty, desire, creativity, those dynamic motivations that cannot be explained through pure reasoning. In spite of our extensive analysis and organization of society to improve its functions, we serves as a reminder to cherish those aspects of the soul that makes up who we are. People. Thank you to all our kind patrons for their support. Visit the Sparks360 Patreon page on how you too can contribute to my work and get early access to videos and art. Visit my Twitter for published artwork, Discord if you want to socialize, or check out my world building project, Epoch of Harmony. Liking this video and subscribing will also help this channel grow. Thanks for watching.